Hey, and he's going to be giving us an introductory session on socialism and Marxism and after a bit of questions potentially in discussion. Okay, take it away. Thanks. Um, okay, so basically this session was to be part of a um, parallel session with another more in-depth session happening at the same time. Um, this talk is backed by popular demand from last year. <laughs> Oh, I thought Helene was going, I thought there was a question on <laughs> So, um, kind of just to kick this off, like, that's, that's the nature of the talk. So when we're talking about what is socialism, what is Marxism, like, I'm not really giving a definitional approach. Like, a definitional approach, if you were looking at that question, the immediate thing that would spring to my mind to, um, you know, to have that discussion would be, Basically, the first thing I'd think of going to is um, Lenin's work, Three Sources and Three Components of Marxism, and you'd discuss basically how Marxism is, the, is um, not necessarily a fusion, but a development of um, three kind of sets of, um, sets of thought and practice. So that would be like um, German philosophy, um, um, with kind of the influence of Hegelian dialectic and the materialism of Kohlberg um, and the development with that, with the um, theory and the practice of class struggle um, in Europe and, and then a kind of merit and then a kind of developing of these things along with the um, political economy um, being bourgeois political, classical political economy being developed by um, Ricardo and Smith and those things are drawn together um, and become the body, um, the theory of the body that we call Marxism. But we like giving this talk um, for trying to engage with people who are just who might be new to concepts of Marxism and things like that. I thought it might be better to look at misconceptions um, around popular misconceptions around Marxism that you know that are common um, amongst everyday people and workers and. Um, so forth. So I thought I'd kind of take a look at you know four or five or six or you know a few few of the popular misconceptions we come across, and I think it's also um, it's also like a valid thing to look at even for people who are experienced in Marxism or who are theoretically developed or whatever, um, as to you know just kind of think about how we. Engage with Mar how we engage with people on the street at your sales or in your workplace or whatever around um, questions of socialism that may come up with people. So um, some of the key kind of um, misconceptions that we'll take a look at are like dictatorship and democracy, um, kind of like the the experiences of socialism, some of which have become um, negative experiences and how that is set in people's kind of historical memory or knowledge of what socialism is. Um, touching on this idea of socialism and the implied kind of state control of interpersonal and personal affairs and um, control of the individual. A lot of people, like when we say that we're revolutionaries, you know, they obviously, um, revolution is a, you know, a lot different to reform in the sense that we think that Ultimately, um, an extension of politics is 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 the, the highest extension of politics is um, war or, or struggle, and so that's you know in, in a kind of armed way, and so that's um, that's something that um, people um, definitely um, might become worried about when we um, discussing um, revolution. Um, just touching on this idea of the, the eternity of capitalism, or capitalism in its net, as kind of like the natural state of affairs or of society. And basically, I think um, when Phil does his talk later on, um, we get we get a lot more in depth into that, those kinds of ideas. Um, human greed um, is a popular thing we come across. I find it quite embarrassing to actually, it's just so kind of like, um, so kind of low level to talk about this idea of human greed, but people often do come up with that as a common response against um, why socialism is impossible. Um, debunking the thing of, you know, um, socialism would ideally be great, or that socialists are idealists. Um, 
the suppression of individuals <coughs> by um, socialist projects. Um, also, there's a lot around kind of party cultures and um, you know, you know, people towing the party line and things like this, and issues of um, leadership and cult of personality and so forth. So I just want to get into these things. Um, with issues of dictatorship and democracy, for a lot of people, the word dictatorship is a very um, it carries a lot of very um, negative connotations, and we obviously put forward quite forcefully, perhaps in a more palatable way, but ultimately our politics, we do stand for um, for the dictatorship. The thing about this, however, is that um, we, we we see dictatorship as a question of class, and often. Um, in bourgeois history, because bourgeois history is explained through um, leaders and what leaders do instead of like, you know, forces of production and so forth, creating um, new possibilities um, and development in society. Um, there's, there, there is this question around, um, around you know, the, the, pers the personal is emphasised within dictatorship. And it's probably without um, there is probably good reason, uh, or, or there is probably enough in the history of socialism as it has been practiced for, um, for a bourgeois representation of this to be able to uh, have, have some kind of um, um, hold. And so the fundamental thing, for the fundamental thing there is that our view is that um, a class holds power in society and basically um, that class um, 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 practices a dictatorship over the, over the other class, and we our view is that we want to move to what we would call like perhaps a softer softer term is uh, a workers state in which the working class holds the monopoly of power. Um, Marx and Engels um, originally, um, like if you read something like um, Critique of Goethe Program or something like this, they didn't necessarily um, introduce this concept of the, um, of the working class ruling through a dictatorship at its institutional kind of form, um, but you know didn't really um, push too fit, too much further before, um, from a kind of representative um, parliamentary system. Um, after 1905, and then it's founded quite strongly in, um, I mean, very strongly um, analysed in um, State and Revolution. Um, Lenin really expanded the kind of theory of dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, and however, like within within this idea of the dictatorship, um, we also uphold that this, the dictatorship of the proletariat would be f uh, would be, and there are current living examples of how it is actually far more democratic than bourgeois democracy in a popular way, in which we would explain that. Bourgeois democracy is undemocratic, is, you know, that basically um, there are presidential prerogatives, we have no say over how budgets are um, made, etc. Um, but but more that, you know, we come out and vote every every three years, four years, five years, or whatever it is. Um, there are strong examples of di direct democracy. Um, the councils of the Paris Commune in 1871 um, the workers' Soviets within Russia developing um, in the early 1900s. Um, to provide some more <coughs> sort of kind of living example, I can't see some of my notes there, but um, in, in Cuba, for example, at the moment, um, while obviously we wouldn't um, think that Cuba is the perfect kind of socialist example at the moment, um, you can still see how there are very strong forms of, of democracy um, within a country that doesn't have a um, multi-party um, electoral system at national level. Um, so there are open elections for national assemblies, um, assemblies electing ministers, and with those assemblies electing ministers and the president. Um, any citizen can stand for assembly, even not if, um, even not if in, uh, if in, in the Communist Party um, and be elected. Um, there is 90% voter participation. If 